The vast territories of China brim with abundant resources and a multitude of biodiversity. The country supports one-fifth of the world's population, but only occupies one-fifteenth of the Earth's total landmass. Over thousands of years, from generation to generation, this expansive land has given the Chinese people a bounty of herbal medicines. Spring and summer bring so many colors to the world of plants. In the world of herbs, their beauty creates a competition that is comparable to a beauty pageant. Each herb blossom feeds the rivalry by drawing our attention to their sophistication, beauty, and delicateness like a band of sisters. On the summer solstice, the sun burns brightly on the Balaluk Mountains near Yuming County and Xinjiang Autonomous Region. The heat compounds the impatience of the Honghua flower pickers who have come from far and wide. They are waiting for the flowers of the Honghua herb to bloom. And then, overnight, the air is filled with the stimulating fragrance they have all been waiting for. The Honghua flowers have bloomed, forming a reddish-gold carpet spilling over the hills and the plains. Honghua is reminiscent of a passionate flamenco dancer. In full bloom, her astonishing beauty will take our breath away. Honghua is the dried flower of Cathamus tinctorius. It is used to activate blood circulation, dredge meridians, and dissipate blood stasis to relieve pain. The Honghua flower must be picked just when the color turns from yellow to red, not a moment earlier or later. The window of opportunity is narrow, so the flower pickers get up at dawn, working quickly and efficiently. A couple of months later, in a place thousands of miles away, it's time to harvest another flowering herb. Its Chinese name is similar to Honghua, but its market value is a thousand times more. In English, this flower is called saffron. In Chinese, it is called zhang honghua which means red flowers from Tibet. But it is not originally from Tibet. The name Zhang Honghua derives from the early Ming Dynasty trade routes that crossed through Tibet on the way to Middle Eastern and Mediterranean countries. Gliding into view like a noble lady entering a ballroom, Zhang Honghua is a striking beauty who draws champions to her side to offer protection. This precious flower blooms in early November during daylight for only a couple of hours and then quickly fades away. 8 o'clock in the morning is the busiest time of the day for Yu Fu Sheng, a retired village party secretary, who is now a Zhang Honghua farmer. To guarantee the flowers are of the best quality, the men pick the flowers, and then the women pluck the styles out. This delicate process must be completed in a matter of minutes, or the potency will be lost. The herbal essence comes only from the stigma of the flower. As many as 80 to 100 fresh flowers are needed to collect just one gram of filaments. Timing is crucial for Zhang Honghua farmers. After the picking and selecting, the featherlight flower styles need to be dried quickly. 
Today, there is no time to rest or eat. Yu must rush off to the Farmers Association where he can dry his harvest and sell them in good time. This is the busiest time of the year for the association. <laughs> Yu stands to make 25 to 30 renminbi per gram during this visit. This year's harvest was good. The passion for precious herbs demands much time and great care to reap the rewards. One more blooming beauty that requires this level of attention has been described as a mountain fairy. Unfortunately, though, it has a tragic fate. The Mila Mountains, located on the borders of Lhasa and Ningqi cities, is where the saints and fairies live, according to Tibetan lore. It's early autumn, and the icy cold wind is already blowing hard. Climbing up these mountains at 4,000 meters above sea level is physically challenging, even for local Tibetans. <laughs> Ms. Padma Usan is a researcher from the Tibetan Academy of Agricultural and Animal Husbandry Science. She's in charge of breeding rare medicinal herbs. She is searching for a very rare medicinal herb known as Hong Jing Tian or Rhodiola. This herb grows and flourishes under extremely cold and difficult climate conditions in the high mountain plateaus. Hong Jing Tian herb is the dried root and rhizome of the Rhodiola, which has energy boosting and anticoagulant properties. It is also used for the prevention of acute mountain sickness. For domestic and foreign tourists, Hong Jing Tian has been transformed from being a hard to find herb to a must have souvenir. The life of Hong Jing Tian has changed ever since. The first research project that Padma applied for when she started working with the academy was the breeding of Hong Jing Tian. Padma has been working with the Hong Jing Tian breeding project for over 11 years, but the result has not been very promising. There is still a long way to go. Every September, if you happen to be up in the high snowy plateau with its thin air, you will see a woman doing her field research. Only on the southern side of the mountains, 5,200 meters above sea level, higher than where most herb hunters would go, can one actually see Hong Jing Tian's blood-red leaves contrast beautifully with the clear blue sky and the snowy white mountains. Padma happily but cautiously collects some seeds and leaves from this Hong Jing Tian bush. What she hopes is that one day soon she can regrow the seedlings from her project back into the wild natural environment of Hong Jing Tian and see them flourish. 
Das ist äh, der Eimer. After 11 years of experimenting, Padma has finally sprouted the first batch of Hongjing Tian seedlings and is going to replant them back on the high plateau. It's hard to predict if this experiment will work, but it's definitely worth trying. When the legendary Hongjingtian herb met the devoted Tibetan researcher Padma, the seeds of its restoration began to take root. Despite the hardships that might be ahead, Padma plants the first batch of her seedlings back into the motherland, filled with hope and love. Winter in Henan Province, China, delivers the expected snow. The snow is a sign 62-year-old Zhang Shaoshou has been waiting for because it means her daughter will visit soon. Winter tonics are popular this time of year. Zhang Shaoshou starts to prepare the special herb for her daughter. It's called Di Huang, or Chinese foxglove root. Jiaozuo City in Henan Province, China, is located on an alluvial plain formed by the Yellow and Qing rivers. Its highly fertile yellow soil provides perfect conditions for the Di Huang herb. Jiaozuo is famous as the place where the most potent Di Huang comes from. Di Huang is one of the most commonly used tonic herbs and has different names for different forms. Raw, sun-dried Di Huang is known as Sheng Di Huang. After it's dried and then steamed, it is called Shu Di Huang. Di Huang has differing medicinal effects depending on the way it's prepared. The sun-dried product cools and cleanses the body, while the dried then steamed root warms and nourishes one's body. Tradition says the highest quality Shu Di Huang should be as dark as ink, as shiny as a mirror, and as sweet as honey. Steaming Di Huang into Shu Di Huang is a demanding and time-consuming process. After washing the dried Di Huang, the roots are marinated in yellow wine. After the marination, the herb is placed in wooden steamers. Metal steamers should not be used since Di Huang will easily pick up a metallic flavor and be ruined. The steaming process is crucial for the transformation of Di Huang's potent properties. The first 48 hours require non-stop steaming. The fire must be carefully tended, making sure it never dies out. In the middle of the night, the temperature drops to 5 below 0 Celsius. <laughs> Zhang's daughter arrives earlier than expected to relieve her mother of her shift. But the daughter knows very well that from the moment they put the Di Huang steamers on the stove, her mother will not be able to get much sleep the entire month. The secret of steaming Di Huang is in the liquid extracted during the steaming process. Every drop must be collected. That is the essence of Di Huang. The Di is the Zhang checks the color of the Di Huang after the first steaming by splitting it open. The brownish color she finds indicates it's not ready. To make the best quality blackened, shiny Shu Di Huang herb, the steamed Di Huang has to be sun-dried, then basted with the liquid extracted from it while being steamed. It is then put back in the steamer to allow the sun-dried Di Huang to completely absorb the liquid. The process is repeated nine times over a month-long period. 
following this time-honored tradition will result in high-quality Shu Di Huang. Modern processes use machine-operated sealed steaming jars with high heat and pressure and reduces the whole process to 24 hours. The traditional month-long steaming and sun-drying method is rarely practiced anymore. From this wintry courtyard of the Zhang family, we watch as a mother tirelessly prepares Shu Di Huang herb in the traditional way. Her devotion to the process reveals her love for her daughter. It's not uncommon to see the same thing happen with other ordinary families all across China. Family members diligently turning raw herbs into medicine to show their love and care for each other. Shishuang Bana in the old Dai language means the land of Shangri-La, the utopia of myth. Here, far away from the noise of big cities, is a real place and a kind of paradise. 80-year-old Dai doctor Kang Long Xiang is reading from the palm leaf manuscripts about a miraculous local species, Long Shui Shu, or the dragon blood tree. This tree is an ancient plant with extremely valuable medicinal properties. Dai doctors know the secrets of applying it clinically. With proper instruction from Dr. Kang Lang, apprentice Zhao Yin Hong has learned the uses of Long Shui Shu. The Long Shui Shu tree trunk naturally contains a reddish resin. In its solidified form, the resin looks like clotted blood, or Shui Jie, which means dried blood in Chinese medicine. The ancient Chinese medicinal texts record Shui Jie as the sacred herb for resolving blood stasis. It moves the blood and relieves pain. It also treats hemorrhages and stops bleeding. To further understand Shui Jie's dual medicinal properties of moving the blood and stopping the bleeding at the same time, Zhao undertakes the mission to find the source of this herb, the wild Long Shui Shu tree. The Long Shui Shu can live as long as 8,000 years. It has a tall straight trunk and very few branches. Individual trees are scattered around the primitive forest and are hard to find. Zhao's target tree is over a hundred years old. It may take some time to find it. His hunting efforts pay off, and Zhao finds a hundred-year-old Long Shui Shu tree deep in the forest. These reddish, resin-filled wood chunks carved from the tree are the key targets of this hunt. These chunks contain naturally formed resins secreted and solidified in the tree trunk. This process begins in the inner layers of the trunk with the help from microbes and oxidation. Zhao has another worry. The wild trees are becoming scarcer in the wilderness. Every time he ventures into the Dai communities in the mountains, Zhao always teaches the local Dai people how to use the leaves of Long Shui Shu tree to make a tonic drink. Drinking the tea made from the fresh leaves of the tree helps reduce fatigue and lower blood sugar levels. Zhao hopes that after learning about the benefits these trees provide, the local Dai people will want to protect the scarce and extremely valuable Long Shui Shu tree, the source of the Shui Jie herb. When extracting the resins from the wood chunks to make the herb Shui Jie, the chunks must be chopped up into smaller pieces, then put into a pot of boiling water. Dr. Kong Long Xiang 
Keep stirring the boiling water in the pot, thoroughly mixing the water and the wood pieces. The water turns red gradually as the ingredients are separated out. It takes seven days for this process. After seven days, the red liquid finally solidifies into a chunk called shi jie. All living things must grow and die. Herbs are no exception. They bloom and then wither. In the ever-turning wheel of reincarnation, people persist in their efforts to enhance the warmth of life with herbs. Yet, the baptism of time does not diminish the process because this ongoing cycle is a silent witness to the glory of life. <laughs>